Hello, my name is Stephen Cretney, and I'm with the West Kootenai Climate Hub. Our mission is to accelerate climate action in our region, uh, primarily through facilitating connections, communication, and collaboration among those locally engaged in addressing the climate crisis. We are all volunteers and very excited to be hosting this season's webinar series. Today, we will hear about three community buildings that are going above and beyond. After the three presentations, uh, we'll have a Q&A. So I'll be going through the questions that are posted on the chat. So feel free to type in questions as they pop up into your mind. You don't need to wait till the end to ask, but um, they won't actually be asked and answered until the very, very end. Uh, so today we will be joined uh, by Morag Carter from the Trails uh, Skills Center that'll tell us about their efforts to create a building for the community. Um, we had also planned to have Chief uh, uh, Jason Louis with us to share about the uh, Iakanuki administration and uh, health building in the Creston Valley. Unfortunately, there was a scheduling conflict, but we will still hear about the project as uh, Samantha uh, Pfeiffers has sent us some pictures and some words to read. So we will still get to hear a little bit about that project. Um, um, but first up, we'll be joined by... Uh, Tammy uh, Virgin Burke, who is the Executive Director of the Castlegar and District Chamber of Commerce, to tell us about the Confluence Building. So welcome, Tammy. You can unmute and, uh, and say hello and share your screen. Thank you, Stephen and Laura. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces on the screens and uh, absolutely thrilled to have my uh, building committee chair, Stuart, on here, as well as our architect, Lucy, Lucas Armstrong. So today I'm going to be presenting on the Confluence building. The Confluence is uh, the hub of tourism and economic development. It's been an 11-year labor of love that so many people have been involved in. We have had an incredible board, staff, community members, my family, you name it, we've had involved in this project. Here we go. So one of the things I was asked to present on is how did this all start? Where are we going with it now? And what does the future bring? So I start here with our former Cascara and District Visitor Center building. It was an amazing building. It was built in the 80s and it was built by volunteers. Years, um, incredible building. We were thrilled with it, but unfortunately, we had substantial issues with our foundation. To the left is just one of the cracks that were in the basement, and to the right is where our accessible ramp was that um, obviously had quite a bit of damage to it. We involved so many different engineers, geotech studies, you name it, to try to figure out what were the best options. Could we lift the building up, create a new foundation? Was the foundation fixable? What could we possibly do? And we ended up coming to the conclusion that it was not, uh, we could not repair it. We had to tear the building down and start fresh. So what did we need to do from there? Where are we going to start? I have this sort of, the sky was the limit, but also we didn't have the budget. So we needed to figure out where to go and what to do. So we engrossed in probably so much stakeholder engagement. We went not only regionally, we went across the country, all over the province, trying to figure out what have people built? How do we incorporate public space with program space? We brought in everybody from the regional district, city of Castigar. We did Indigenous consultation. Uh, we had such incredible involvement from our MP and our MLA to try to figure out where to go and what to do. During all of our engagement, we came up with so many different schematic designs. We brought in Lucas Armstrong. He worked with us so patiently as we had so many people involved in our committee trying to figure out what exactly could we land on. Some of the words that came to us is we wanted it to be unique, inspiring. How green could we possibly get with this? Public space was really important to us because we're quite different than our neighbors in Trail and Nelson that have public space in their malls where people can gather, nonprofits can sell raffle tickets, whatever they need to do. 
we needed to ensure that part of that, if we could, could be created in this, in this building. We were inspired by wood. Forestry is our major economic driver in our area. And so we wanted to make sure that we are incorporating wood and really showcasing it. Diversity was important to us, inclusion. It needed to be accessible and we needed to address the needs that we had in our community, but we also had to balance it with our ROI. So for every piece of area, every square footage that we had in the building, we had to figure out not only how could we pay for it, how could we sustain it and was it actually needed? So in our work that we do with Lucas Armstrong, while we were looking at what type of green type of builds could we do, he brought in this new concept to us, which is Passive House. Passive House is quite unique. It not only is it about creating a green building, it is about ensuring that the people in the building have the best environment as well too. So it kind of is a double, a double whammy, which to us was quite exciting. And we will actually reach 85% reduced emissions, which when you operate a building as a nonprofit organization, this is really important. It's not just about being green, but also the fact that we'll have one twelfth of, the, of the, our utility costs from a traditional build. So while we were going through this process, again, through Lucas Armstrong, we found out about this new concept of mass timber. Matt um, Plesnikos was working on bringing in a mass timber plant. And our project was delayed so many times to mass timber into the building. The majority of our building is built with mass timber with a traditional roof. In our whole building concept that we had is the visitor center needed to be sizable and also we wanted to create something that was open to the public as much as possible. It was news to us when I worked with Destination BC that we will be the first visitor center in British Columbia to be actually open seven days a week throughout the whole entire year. And one of the biggest things that we also were looking at is when we talk about different um, needs for the space is co-working space was not something we had in Castlegar, And so we wanted to create a co-working space that would be open 24 seven. We have a lot of regional people that come to Castlegar that need space for whether it's two days, five hours, a week or a month. And so we wanted to be able to have an accessible way that they could go online, book their hours, their week or their day, and they could get in by coding in and coding out on the side door and use the space 24 seven. So not only are we a green building for the actual build, we wanted to make sure that we bring in the concepts of uh, green into the way that people are utilizing the space. So for people who are either renting the offices or in the co-working space, our concept is, is that well, we want people to pack in and pack out. And hopefully that pack in and pack out is your own reusable containers from home. So here it is. A lot has changed with the building. The same, the same visual is there, but if you drive by the building or if you follow us on any of our social media or on our website, you'll see that the exterior has changed. And so it's not a white, it's actually a beautiful pewter blackish type color. So what's the program in the building? We have the West Community Gateway Visitor Center, and then we have our program in the North Wing, which is our Chamber of Commerce, our destination Casagar, as well as our Casagar District Economic Development Partnership, which we co-administer with Community Future Central PE. We were um, had a fantastic opportunity where Mercy Casagar came to the table, and we created a space, a boardroom space for up to fifty people, and it was a need that we needed to fill where we could have seamless technology, as high technology as we could possibly have because there's a lot of people in our area that need to have meetings at all different times to with Europe and um, that needed to have the technology that doesn't exist right now in some places. Co working space, which we talked about, we've got four lease offices as well as meeting spaces. So here's a little bit of the layout. If you go look to the left, they call that our south wing, that's where our co working spaces are and our for lease offices as well as we have an amazing pocket kitchen that is actually a seating area as well too because we know that most people gather in kitchen spaces. We have the sort of pinkish color, orange color that is our visitor center area and then the purple is all where our offices, our program space is and the Mercer self our room. And then we have one area upstairs where we have all of our mechanical as well as an office meeting space. 
So our funders, this whole building was really interesting because when we started looking at funding, it was important for us to ensure that we really considered climate change. We tried to go as green as we could go. And that's how we were able to be successful in starting to have people consider to fund us. So right off the get go, we were really, really fortunate to have an investing in Canada um, funding for $2.4 million. Since then, we've been incredibly successful with everything from Redip to Pacifican to the city of Casper in the first place, um, providing us with a land lease. Uh, regional districts, we've had Trollocs with donations. It's been an immense, immense opportunity that we have had and so much engagement federally, provincially and locally. So we've raised $7.3 million in non-borrowed revenue to date. Our goal meter is $8.3 million. We are beyond thrilled. We've also secured um, two opportunities for financing um, just in this last week so that we can complete our process. And uh, are, we're hoping for success with one final grant for a million dollars, which will take us to the end of completion in which we won't need financing. Oh, this is interesting. There we go, sorry. That slide should have been at the end. Um, that's all my information. So what I wanna do is give you the opportunity. This video was created with some support from Lucas. From, so here's our building. This is a beautiful 3D fly-through image. And, and while you're looking at it, I can explain to you that uh, we'll reach substantial completion March 26, which is super exciting for us. Um, this building started last summer and to have a building go up that fast is remarkable. Every week that I go in there, it's new, it's exciting, it's moving so quickly. Um, when the building comes to fruition with the uh, substantial completion, we will be working on, so here we are walking through the visitor center through the opening. Um, all this is mass timber. The windows up above is absolutely remarkable, the sunlight that comes in to meet passive house certification. We have the Mercer Salgar bordering right over here, a sliding wall to get, enter into the space where we'll have a video of the wall as well too. So while we're starting with having people go into the building in our lease spaces, which will probably in about April, we're looking on our landscape, um, some indigenous, part, indigenous partnerships that we have. And while we're finishing up our paving, and then we will be having our grand opening, looking probably at early fall, September. Here's our offices for lease and our co-working space area. And our phone booth. We're heading back outside now. So some of the other things that we're bringing into our building is a new ambassador program. And the ambassador program is where we'll be able to involve people from the community. Uh, we'll have uh, staff working alongside our ambassadors. And so we'll be able to have all of them learn about our green initiatives to really incorporate not just um, the components of what visitors may be looking for, but also that everything that we do is being really mindful um, to be incorporating um, a green concept to tourism as well as to our community. This is a great visual where you can actually see from up above the different components of the building. And I'll just finish off here at this point by saying, Thank you, I really, really appreciate being able to share this project with you. Um, we have um, a lot of visuals, pictures, and more information that you can find. Right here is some of the ways that you can access us. And I know that um, Laura has asked me to share our links into the chat, which I'll be happy to do. That's it for me, Stephen and Laura. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, I'm ex definitely excited to visit this space when it opens. Um, I can't, I'm trying to remember what the stat you said. I'm I'm really ex impressed with. I think it was 85 percent reduced emissions, and I 85%. think you said that utility costs will be about one twelfth of traditional buildings. That's that's incredible. 
That is really amazing. Um, yeah, it was interesting just on a note with that, uh, Stephen, to finish off that one of of our funders when they asked to see what our operational budget would be the first thing he said to me is in an 83 square hundred foot building you have definitely underestimated what your operational costs will be because what you put in for a year is what the monthly cost should be and i'm like no actually that is accurate That's wow wow i can't wait to hear yeah an updates you know a, a year two years three years down the road to go like you know how, how that actually pans out because that is amazing and that is something that is worth sharing around because yeah obviously that's that's incredible well thank you tammy we You're are welcome. going to uh uh hear next from Morag carter who's the executive director of the skills center in trail and they're doing a big reno um welcome Morag. it's really nice to see you again even if it's through a screen hi Hello. It's lovely to see you too. Um, hang on, let me just um, share this. And um, need to, uh, there we go, start this. All right. Uh, so thank you very much for the invite. Um, uh, Tammy, that is such an impressive building. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it's going to be a fantastic addition to uh to Castlegar and, and great for the region as well. Um, so this is a, a little bit of a different project, different approach. Um, so this is a renovation and um, uh, it turns out that it's actually a little bit of a complex in a, in a, um, a renovation. Um, so um, the origin uh, story for the, for this building is, is, um, is slightly different. Um, there's been a, a, a you know, there, there are a lot of service uh, organizations in trail and um, for a very long time, there has been a conversation off and on about, wouldn't it be great to share a space? Wouldn't it be great that, you know, if we could reduce our operating costs, wouldn't it be great if we could share? So that, that was, that's been going on in the background. Um, but then a couple of other things came together in uh, 2021. Um, so um, the, the first of that was that, um, uh, for the for the first time, um, the skill center was running a little bit of uh, had a, a little bit of an accumulated um, 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 uh, a surplus, so that we could actually start thinking about um, purchasing a building. We currently rent space from Fortis, um, and we were also running out of uh, space to um, uh, to run our own programs. So one day we were out for a walk at lunchtime, and we noticed that was a for rent uh, sign available for, uh, in this in this building. And so we decided to go in and have a look. Um, it turned out that the ground floor space wasn't any bigger than we had at the at the at the in the Fortis building, but that um, when we asked about it, we discovered that the building might be for sale, and that would that that is was a game changer for us. So that's uh, that became the thing to think about. So um, where is it? So this building is right at the corner of um, uh, El Dorado Street and Esplanade, right, right here um, in, uh, in, oops, sorry, in, uh, in Trail. Um, it's right on the river. It's an absolutely gorgeous location. The building the, uh, on, this, on this particular property, it's actually two buildings on one title and it was originally, the both buildings were built in 1932 and one of them was the armory to start with. Um, it was when we bought it, as you can see um, from this picture here, a little shabby and uh, and definitely looking like it was coming to the end of its, at the end of its life. Um, so it, it, it was definitely gonna need a, quite a bit of work. We also suspected that there was probably quite a substantial contamination of hazardous materials. And we also knew that the energy consumption and the emissions profile for the building were um, uh, was, was gonna be a problem for us. So um, we, you know, when we, when we really thought about buying this building, we decided that we were actually going to think about what we were going to do with the building. So we wanted to create a space that was um, that first of all that we could share with with uh, with uh, other organisations if they wanted to uh, run programs through it as well. We wanted to create a space that was welcoming, accessible, and inclusive. 
Um, the the Skill Center currently holds a Rick Hansen Foundation uh, certification, which we definitely wanted to make sure that we had in a new building. Um, but we also um, have a certification called CARF, which is the um, it's a, it's a certification for uh, social service uh, organizations who deliver professional support services. So we wanted to make sure that we were able to to have that too. We wanted a building that was going to be sustainable and we definitely wanted a building that was going to be energy efficient and, and uh, climate friendly. We wanted to invest in the local community and we particularly wanted to invest in um, making sure that we use the opportunity to also build local skills for dealing with uh, complex uh, environmental retrofits. That's the nature of the work, the programming that we offer. We wanted to make sure that it was a community asset when it was done. And we also wanted to provide the um, and build the long term financial security for the for the skill center going forward. So we made an offer to purchase uh, in October 2021, um, and we didn't finalize the sale until 2020, September 2022. And in the um, in the 11 and a half months between the offer and the and the completion of the sale, we spent about $200,000 on a building that we did not yet own, but we wanted to make sure that we understood um, the challenges that we were going to face going into this building. Um, in the end, um, it turns out that that $200,000 was a very um, good investment for us. We only There was only actually one a little surprise, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, it was it was a, it was a good investment. We offered the building for tender uh, uh, in um, February and March for the retrofit. We awarded the contract to Hilltech in March um, 2023. Um, so just a quick note about that: we, um, even though there was a lot of um, there's a lot of government funding that's going into this building, um, we uh, we wanted to make sure that we. Um, that we gave the contract to a local uh, provider and a, a, a local con uh, contractor. And we wanted to do that for a couple of reasons. One was obviously investing in our local economy, but the second was to make sure that we were reducing or eliminating as many supply chains um, delays as we possibly could. So um, it, you know, after demolition and the and the rebuild we're looking at uh, project completion in june 2024 and we are looking for um, occupancy in the summer probably in july so one of the things that we did initially was a um uh, an energy have an, an energy profile of the building done so um uh, this is actually for both buildings so we were looking at a very significant uh, fuel consumption and greenhouse gas emissions data and um and obviously you can see from the fuel cost in there that the uh what what we were spending initially was nearly was was over thirty one thousand dollars in in fuel costs um the proposed case um for doing the retrofit on one of these buildings um for both so that the, the um, energy profile here is for both of these buildings means that we are going to be reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, fuel costs, and um, energy consumption by more than 50%. In actual fact, we've had a subsequent energy profile done, which actually reduces this uh, the, our entire profile by over 60%. So in the, the uh, improvements are, are coming from um, a fuel switch. The building was run on gas. Uh, it, we've taken out the gas from the uh, side of the building that we are retrofitting and using heat pumps. There is a solar array that's going on top of the uh, gym area, which is the building that we're not actually retrofitting. We've done some substantial upgrades to the building envelope, and we have also removed all of the uh, toxic and hazardous chemicals from the building. And that included um, about 1,300 bags of asbestos waste that we took out of the building, along with a lot of lead, because, you know, this is obviously, um, uh, you know, tech is here, so there was obviously lead in the, in the building. And there were also PCBs and mercury in the lighting ballasts. So um, the building envelope. Um, uh, this is actually, for me, this is a really interesting story. I mean, you know, in, in, uh, in when you're doing um, the, these kinds of retrofits, the building envelope is the, is almost always the most important thing to to, um, to deal with. Um, 
so when we did the the demo on the inside of the original building, um, uh, what we found was better than we expected. So there was original timber from 1932 uh, in the building that we were able to harvest and reuse in the building, but um, there was actually better insulation um, in the original building envelope than we expected to find too. So we were able to boost that. We uh, removed all of the windows and doors and um, replaced them. And then we applied an external um, uh, layer of uh, insulation to the building. Altogether, that was about a million and a half dollars, and the return on investment for that um, is about a hundred years. So this, this is this is unless you are getting, um, unless you you know you're you're making a decision to do this, or unless it was funded, it it becomes a really expensive um, thing to do with the renovation. But it nevertheless is the most ex the most uh, important thing to do with a building. Um, oh, so. Uh, uh, just on these on these photos. So this was the original uh, building. Um, this was taken in the fall of last year before the windows and the doors went in. And then this this photo this photo was taken uh, uh, in the middle of January after the windows and doors had been uh, had been installed. On the inside, the building, um, the, the uh, access accessibility and inclusion program, um, a profile is we are installing a community kitchen on the ground floor. There are three multi-purpose and activity rooms in the building, two on the ground floor and one upstairs. Um, the, the skill center also provides as part of our, um, as part of our, our community um, profile, we also provide invigilation services for people taking exams and people come from all over the Pacific Northwest to do um, their exams in our, in our space. So obviously we want to continue to do that. We, we are providing public access computers and a, and a client lounge area as well in the new space. Um, because we wanted to make sure that we maintained our um, Rick Hansen Foundation, a certification. Uh, we made sure in the design of the building that there were extra wide hallways for wheelchairs and other assistive devices, like, for example, um, um, strollers. There, we, uh, there is an elevator that we that we are installing that will go from the roof to the basement. Um, there is enhanced interior signage, including braille, uh, and also there are inclusive and accessible washrooms and showers. And the um, the shower is actually on the on the second floor, and in the we're up updating and upgrading the washrooms in the next door in the um, in the gym area, which is currently rented to um, uh, Steps Dance, which is a, a community dance um, a school for kids in, in trail. So on the ground floor as built, so this um, area here to the right uh, is the river. And um, this area here where, they, where the title of the slide is, is um, El Dorado Street. These are the two multipurpose rooms um, that we are building on the ground floor. And there is actually a removable wall between these um, between these rooms so it can open up into one gigantic 30 by 30 multi-purpose room it's actually really great um, I was in it last week and it, it, it's beginning to really take shape there is a reception area here and a client uh, lounge area here the community kitchen is here and the the access to it is in an alleyway uh, at the side of the building and when we did the design for this building, um, we made sure that the community kitchen and the washrooms are all on a separate security system, an alarm system, so it can be used 24-7 um, and uh, while the rest of the building is actually secure. And then here is the elevator that goes from the, that's the elevator shaft from the roof to the um, basement. This is just a little bit of a montage. I'm very sorry about two of these photos. So this photo here was taken by a professional photographer. This is these are two of my own terrible photos. Uh, but this was this was taken. Uh, you can see the um, some of the beams that were harvested, some of the wood that was harvested from the original building in this photo here. I wanted to show you that there were you know 
people doing a lot of work. And this was uh, the the discussion that this day was on the ducting for um, um, for the HVAC system. And then this photo was taken last week, and this is actually the reception area. So you can see that the uh, building is actually progressing really quite well. Um, the second floor. Um, oh, so uh, one last thing about the about the ground floor. Because we know that we're going to be sh sharing the building with a number of other organizations, um, although it may be just programs that they're moving into the building rather than their entire operations. We, we also wanted to make sure that the ground floor was a place where we were delivering forward facing community programs. So all of that is concentrated on the ground floor. On the second floor, there, it's mostly offices. And um, while some of them will be delivering client services, it is also a place where people who are, who are doing um, programming or work that is not forward facing and not community serving, um, this will, it will tend to be happen upstairs. So again, there's the elevator, there is a small um, staff kitchen here, but this is mostly uh, offices with the mechanical rooms um, and storage areas here and here. And uh, here is a little bit of a photo montage. Um, so this uh, the this photo at the end here was taken in uh, at the beginning of January, just as the drywall was going to go into the building. Um, this photo was taken about three weeks ago, and um, I, I love this photo because it is a woman that is um, that is doing the drywalling. And um, one of the things that we really like to promote. Uh, at the at the skill center is women in trades and and so this building and uh, some of the people who've been working on it have been a really great opportunity for us to share some of those stories um, and then this uh, photo at the end here is actually the upstairs boardroom that is also overlooking the river so uh, these are some renderings um, so this is the east aspect so the truck here is on the river side of the building the yellow truck here and then the Red is on, this is uh, El Dorado Street here. Um, the, the building isn't quite this white. It's a, it's a sort of a creamy, it's a creamy color, but um, we wanted to make sure that people got to see that we, you know, we had always intended to have things like, you know, the extra wide double automatic entry and uh, around the, um, uh, the, the, um, uh, my God, I've forgotten what the word is. Um, around the around this area here, um, we wanted to make sure that we had room for all organizations were going to be in there to have their signage and it, the same was going to be at the end here as well. Um, and at the back here, this is the entrance to the community kitchen again um, here we've got space for organizational signage sorry. Um, and then the access also to the uh, to the dance studio is here as well. One of the things that we um, are going to also install right here is an LED sign um, that will be hooked up to the uh, roof um, and to the uh, solar, which is which is this is the roof of the gym area. So the, the other building on the lot that we are not renovating this time around. So um, it will have a 50 kilowatt capacity uh, solar ar array on it. Um, and um, so it'll be the, that's actually the first commercial installation of solar and trail. And but be, but because you can't actually see it from the from the ground, we wanted a way of driving a conversation in town about um, about about the nature of having solar on your on your roof and you know how much power it generates. So the idea is that we are going to hook up this solar to the to um, the LED sign on the side here, um, uh, so we can actually start to tell that story. And then finally, there is a small roof garden that's going on the top of the um, renovated side of the building, and um, it's a it, it will have a it has an occupancy limit of twenty five. So it's not a place where we're going to be able to, you know, rent out for parties and things like that. But it, it'll be a lovely thing for uh, the staff and for our clients to be able to use when they are uh, when they're in the building and when the weather is decent enough um, for it to be done. So there are a number of challenges and lessons that we've learned. Um, Marek, Marek, I'm just going to yeah. jump in here just to say uh, um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm too, I'm too you're, you're getting the whip. So All right. you can, okay. you can so say very, some of these. I just want to be uh, wrap yeah. it up quickly. Okay. No, very, very quickly then. So, um, you know, there, there are just a few challenges and lessons that we, that we learned was um, no matter how much money you spend, you, you need to be um, when you, when you, you, you need to be aware that there are going to be unforeseen challenges and expenses that will emerge. So you need to do a lot of prep. You need to make sure that you have a contractor and a knowledgeable designer right on board um, right from the very beginning, because it will actually save you money in the end. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and also to, to make sure that you have a very strong advocate for um, for your project in the room, even when you're not there, because there'll be lots of decisions that will be happen when you are not in the room. You just want to make sure that you've got someone who, there who's looking after your interests. Um, follow up with funders. Um, I'm sure Tammy will say exactly the same thing. Buy local is a really important one, um, uh, including using local contractors because of the um, opportunity to um, uh, to invest in local community, but also in in avoiding uh, delays. Um, and uh, so anyway, so that's just a few of those. And then thank you to our funders here. So these are a bunch of these funders, and we've raised not as much as Tammy has raised. It's really amazing, very impressive. Um, eight million dollars there, but we've only raised about three million dollars for us. But this is it's about 50 percent of the total purchase and cost of the renovation. So which is about six million dollars. So there you go. Wow, that is amazing. Thank you, Mark. And it doesn't have to be a competition on who raises more money. Um, I do. It's, it's, it's nice to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. That there is money out there yeah. for for these kinds of things. Um, yeah, that is a that is it is really uh, the word you were looking for earlier was the word awning, um, where all the logos will be going. Um, but I just want to say quickly before we move on to uh, our final presentation is that I appreciate the the multiple focuses like the accessibility, sustainability, local um, contracting. Um, yeah, amazing, amazing. So finally, we're gonna we're gonna have Laura will be sharing the words. And some photos from Samantha Pfeiffer's from the uh, Yakanuki or Lower Indian Band. As, as mentioned in the intro, um, we had planned to have the Chief uh, Jason Louis join us today, but we're also, but we are thankful that the Samantha was able to write up something for for us to share, so that we can have uh, the story of this beautiful building uh, shared with you today. So welcome, Laura. Yes. Hello. Um... So I'm going to read this, and uh, it's, a, it's a really great description of the, the building and some of its origin. And so here I go. <clears throat> How did the Wilfred Jacobs building come to be? There were so many important factors that contributed to the decision in a new administration building for the community and staff of the Lower Kootenai Band. The old administration complex was constructed in the early 90s and it was outgrown by staff and community many years ago. Once certain staff members had moved into community housing to utilize as offices, it was apparent that something needed to change. LKB, that's Lower Kootenai Band, and she uses that abbreviation here, started working with First Nations Health Authority for funding purposes, and we used our own sources of revenue for this project. The old complex had suited the needs in that time, but with the Wilfred Jacobs building, we had done something we hadn't with the previous one. We were thinking and preparing for the future growth of the Lower Kootenai Band. In the vacant spaces in the lower levels of the Wilfred Jacobs building, currently used for storage for the office and LKB youth group, we had enough space for another 12 offices. So when the time comes, we will be ready to expand. The idea behind this building is to do better and be better for our community and ourselves. The naming of the Wilfred Jacobs building, however, brings a completely different meaning for the building. Wilfred Jacobs was a highly regarded member of the Yakanuki community and to the Tanaha people. He led the fight boldly for our title and rights. He was a business owner. He was a veteran, knowledge keeper, and beloved husband. When he did pass in the early 2000s, it was a great loss for the community. He was survived by his wife, Ab Agatha, who was in fair health. Unfortunately, she passed within a year of Wilfred, and it is believed that their love was so strong that his death was too much to bear, and she left to be with her husband. 
current chief of the local Kootenai band, Jason Louis, has said, names are powerful and as convenient as it is to say WJ building or the office, it's very important to use the name Wilfred Jacobs and remember not only what he did for his people, but what he did across the board. Wilfred ha held a big love for his people, youth and culture, and it was an undeniable it was undeniable the support that came from community when his name was suggested for the building. And with his name, we hope to instill that sense of community, culture, love and safety for our surviving community members within this building. What design elements are built into the Wilfred Jacobs building that holds cultural significance? The entire structure of the building is shaped like a sturgeon nosed canoe a central piece of the ancestral history of the Yakanuki. It mimics the shape of one of our traditional forms of transportation. The inside of the intergenerational room, one of the two boardrooms within the Wilfred Jacobs building, has a large high vaulted ceiling with wooden beams reaching up to the skylight that also takes the shape of the sturgeon nose canoe and in a way copies the style of the inside of a teepee. The murals that are painted all through the Wilfred Jacobs building hold great cultural significance as the people shown in the paintings were all families from Yakanuki. And it was only right to showcase them in the way we did our previous elders in the old administration complex. In the old building, a large mural was painted in the lobby that showcased five elders from Yakanuki, including Wilfred Jacobs. So in a way, we're bringing a sense of community from the old building to this one. How is the space used by Yakanuki? This is the Wilfred Jacobs Administration Building and Health Center. Its intended use is to support and accommodate our community members. We wanted a central building that could allow a member to access anything they need in one place. The idea was to provide access to housing, membership, education opportunities, transportation, healthcare, and so much more. This building has been the center of many gatherings, events, and meetings since the naming ceremony in May of 2022, such as community barbecues. We've hosted a few for the open house of the health unit, celebrating grads and members that completed education during the pandemic, celebrating holidays like family day, et cetera also used for taco sales and fundraisers, local food distributions for community members, elders gatherings, all chief gatherings, council meetings, business meetings, meetings between LKB staff and members. This space is also home to the Lower Kootenai Band's very own health center. The general plan behind this was to provide community easier access to proper and respectful health care. We have been fortunate enough to attain two wonderful registered nurses who worked tirelessly to support the members of the Lower Kootenai Band. When they hosted their open house in May of 2023, members were welcomed to learn more about what health services are offered. Those who attended were also given the opportunity to paint their handprints on the hallways of the health center, not only to bring color, but to showcase the belonging of the building to the LKB community. During this day, Dr. Kurt Jordan of Creston Summit Medical Clinic gifted the Lower Kootenai Band and Health Center with a large wooden plaque that is styled in the same fashion as the one he has outside the clinic where he practices. Dr. Jordan is also one of the physicians that practices once a month at the health center. What challenges were faced in completing the building? When the groundbreaking started, it was not known to the band or contractors the amount of bedrock, which, which ran deeper than expected. Special equipment was needed at this point to not only remove it from the ground, but also to transport out, but also to transport out. Little money was made from selling the rocks that came out, so in turn, it became an extra expense. During the extraction of the bedrock, an incident occurred with the community hired to remove it, where the bed of the truck was left raised, and while driving, a power line was caught by the bed of the truck and knocked out power to a portion of the LKB and Creston communities. 
LKB was left responsible for the cost of this incident and it interrupted working schedules as well. Once I started laying the foundation around March of 2020, COVID-19 shut the world down and the pandemic really began. As we all know, everyone was left in a state of confusion and panic and fear once workplaces started closing and restrictions were placed everywhere. And sure enough, construction came to a halt. CERB was another difficulty that proved hard to overcome. It was put into place for a very good reason, but unfortunately there were a few who abused the system so that then we were left with a constant turnover of workers as well as absent employees due to illness and restrictions around it. What once was an estimated $5.2 million project quickly turned into a $6.7 million project as the cost of materials kept rising. It was almost every other week we were seeing an increase in prices. And lastly, opening our doors, May 2022, two years after the initial groundbreaking. The Wilfred Jacobs building staff were allowed to move into the new building in March of 2022. Restrictions, restrictions regarding COVID-19 had slowly started to lift and the hope of gaining back some sort of unison within community was slowly rising. There was little time left to plan a powwow it's as it's usually held during the long weekend in May. So the idea was to host a grand opening the same weekend and incorporate some of the aspects of the powwow into the opening. A drum group attended, dancers, a large amount of community and visitors and friends from around the valley. A few elders from the community were part of the ribbon cutting. They had never had something like this in their time and it was only right to have them lead us into welcoming the new building. One of those elders was Chief Jason Louis' father and council member, Robert Louis Sr. Robert had planned an honoring for Jason, unbeknownst to him, for leading the community through the worst parts of the pandemic. He had gifted him a plaque that captured the sight of two eagles soaring through the air. Once the dancers had started, everyone was witness to two large eagles flying and soaring directly overhead. Jason felt this to be a sign of the reconciling between him and his father. Sadly, Robert passed later that year in August. Although it hit the community with a deep sadness, Jason felt as though that plaque was a captured moment in time just for him. Robert Louis Sr. was a big advocate for this building and the work being done here, and his work will forever live here. We made it through major setbacks financially and with the strong voices that had been present in our community, such as Wilfred Jacobs and Robert Louis Sr., we are given the courage and strength to use our own voices and stand our ground. Access and thank you for listening to the story of our building, Samantha Pfeiffers. And she shared, uh, let's see how come that's not advancing for me. Hmm. She shared some photos um, and she, she did want me to qualify this with only using these photos for the purpose of the webinar because they've experienced theft of their culture, photos, creation stories, et cetera, in recent years and are hoping to avoid future issues. So I wanted to do that as well. So these first few photos are some of the architectural photos, um, starting from the top left, traditional sturgeon nosed canoe uh, placed at the very front entrance of the building. To the right, the council chambers Second, the second boardroom in the building. Most of the chief and council meetings take place here. On the bottom left, the photos of our members on the wall in traditional regalia, gifted from SD8 and displayed in our intergenerational room. And on the right bottom, mural of a Yakanuki family in a sturgeon-nosed canoe. The top left here, the skylight of our intergenerational room also mimics the style of the sturgeon nose canoe. In the top right, mural of Yakanuki people on horseback, another traditional form of transportation. And below that, a mural of traditional markings from the Yakanuki people. And at the bottom, metalwork sign made by a Creston local and friend of the Lower Kui Band. And then uh, here are some other photos uh, on the on the top left 
is Robert Louis Sr. raising his fist in triumph during the grand opening of the Wilfred Jacobs building. To the right uh, top, the uh, LKB Health Center entrance. And then on the bottom left, handprints painted on the wall by various members. Uh, uh, can you change this yep, slide? Yeah. Yep. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention to what was there. Uh, Stephen uh, adjusted the uh, slides to make them bigger. So there we go. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, Horn prints painted on the wall by various members. Um, one of the rooms on the right meant for counseling and mental health purposes. On the, and the health staff pictured on the bottom left with the plaque gifted from Dr. Kurt Jordan of the Creston Summit Medical Clinic. And on the bottom right is one of the rooms available for the Creston physicians to use when practicing at LKB's health center. And so uh, Sam, Sam or Samantha says, thank you for having the Lower Kootenai Band be part of this webinar. And thank you, Laura, for, for reading, reading those words and sharing the pictures from Samantha. Um, I do understand that the building also uh, has some several sustainability and energy efficiency design features built into it, um, including integrated passive solar design, LED lighting, abundant insulation, and uh, energy efficient windows. Um, but I do appreciate how uh, the cultural aspect of that um, building is it was the focus from Samantha. Um, yeah, so three different communities, three different community buildings that are all well, all sound amazing, um, it, you know, in development. Um, yeah, I'm excited to go visit them all. Uh, there are some questions from the chat and from some emails that came in. Um, I'll start off with uh, one that, that came in in the text that well, this was for Tammy. Um, it was, what happens to water drainage off the roof now? I'm going to quickly jump in and say it was answered by um, uh, by the architect, but... I will still answer, ask the question. I'll read what the architect had said. And uh, if, if you want to add anything to it, great. If not, that's fine. But what happens to water draining off the roof? Well, the answer is it runs off the deep overhangs into gravel trenches where a substantial amount uh, uh, disperses into the adjacent landscape elements. So I don't know if anything wants to Lucas or, or Tammy, if you want to add to that at all, or that's fine. Um, and no, then I was else. grateful for oh. Lucas's response. Yeah, totally. Thank you, Lucas, for jumping in there. Um, someone also sent an email uh, or say they missed a few minutes and they're wondering for that same building, Tammy, is there solar on this building and is the heat cooling by heat pump? So uh, you could answer that. I'm going to jump in on the solar part. Um, we did a lot of work to look at if there was opportunities to do solar. And um, the, we chose not to do that option at this time because of some of the technology that was related to it that we just couldn't figure out the ROI on it and that it would produce enough that would be a value for us with this project. The second part of the question, I can get Lucas to jump in on. Sure, thank you. Um... Yeah, it is a heat pump system that both heats and cools uh, the building. And because of the incredibly reduced demand, uh, we have two very small uh, fan coil boxes on one side of the building that you'll be able to see as you're parking in the parking lot. Um, and then um, another part of the HVAC I'll mention while we're at it is the uh, HRVs that are located in the mechanical room upstairs, uh, which give um, filtered fresh air um, all the time and um, because of that uh, extremely reduced uh, energy use because we're not blowing hot air out if anyone uh, if you're not familiar with an HRV it, it allows hot air from the outgoing air or heat from the out outgoing air to be transferred to the incoming air and so you have um, maintain that heat in the building. Nice lovely. Thanks, Lucas. Um, Morag, I was wondering that given your your project was a renovation as opposed to a clean slate, um, the, the, the kind of challenges are obviously within that, wondering if there was an extra influx of money, if there was things that you were like, oh, what would you have liked to have also done and gone beyond? Like even as Tammy had just said, like, oh, we looked at solar, the ROI wasn't there for that. What about for you on your 
your project and you're on mute just so you know um thank you um i'm i'm i think we managed to capture all of the things that we um originally thought of um uh you know probably need to think about that a little bit but, i mean there were there were obviously bits and pieces that um that we haven't been able to do um but you know for the you know for, for the purposes of this building um installing solar doing the you know ripping out the the gas doing the fuel switch um redoing the building envelope all of those were the you know that those were the the big things that we that we wanted to make sure that we did and then in, in just improving the accessibility um so yeah we we were we had, we're actually feeling uh, at the moment that we we've done what we set out set out to do or is you know that's being that is being it's in the process of being done but i am almost certain that once we actually finish the project and move into it there'll be things that we will um wish that we have uh, wanted that we wanted to do earlier Totally. And then you can get a bunch of extra money and do it then. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't help but think of the parallels between, well, a, a project like that. And um, in, in Nelson, there's one of the civic building in Nelson is, is there's going to be, I'm not sure where the project is, but it's a full renovation and, and we're hoping to uh, have that community space be as impressive as Castle Gars and Trails here. So it's amazing. Um, we are at the end. Um going to see if anything uh oh there was one question here in the chat was the initial planning for these projects and grant applications done in-house or were they guided by an architect or other consultant yeah, quick yes no kind of answer to both for both you guys i could jump in super quick um yeah. all of our grant writing was done in-house by myself um the one thing i will say is if you ever going to apply for any of the grants that we did especially infrastructure how valuable and important it is to make sure that you take the time because you're going to need your architect. You'll need to hire, whether it's GHG missions people, there is a lot of consultants. Um, they're very, very in, um, integral, most of the applications that you need to for green infrastructure. So um, please make sure you're prepared and you've given yourself a lot of time and that the people are available because there's not a lot of people out there who can and do the GHG mission work for you. Happy to consult with anybody if you are not consult, but to provide more information if anybody needs. Thank you very much, Terry. Maura, um, did you have any? Yeah, so uh, for us, um, it was a combination of, um, uh, we have a really great network um, of, of people around us who have um, a lot of very deep experience on, on, um, on doing building retrofits, which we definitely tapped into. Um, and uh, we also worked with uh, engineers in uh, in in trail to to uh, to do the initial designs for this, uh, and then um, we went to cover in Nelson, who uh, helped us do some of the architectural work around it too. Nice, thank you. Well, that brings the end to our uh, our February webinar um in march we will be doing one on march 15th um uh, weaving together people in place uh creating a climate of resilience this is uh a webinar kind of around bioregionalism so it would be great if anyone and everyone joins us for that as well with new guests thank you so much for for joining um laura will be sending off a um an email once this is all posted online, if in case you want to watch yourself, any of the presenters, or if any of the uh, people viewing want to share it with others. I hope this was interesting for everyone and uh, inspiring as well. Have a, have a great day.